Hello everyone and welcome to the final lifestyle gardening for this year. I'm Kim Todd and today we're going to take a look at cutting back perennials or not, more garden trends and we'll talk to Randy Wolf from Campbell's Nursery about honeyberry or hascap. We'll start today's program by hearing from Matt Soshik about one of the most frequently asked questions on Backyard Farmer, when do I put down my pre-emergent herbicide on my lawn? Matt gives us the solution to this perennial question and other tips on spring weed control. One of the most important topics that we talk about every year uh, when it comes to pre-emergence and their timing and what to use and how to apply them. So I'm just going to kind of lay out some steps on looking at uh, various pre-emergent timings, applications, uh, methods, different types, granulars, sprayables. Uh, so there's a, there's a bunch of different options that you can use, uh, but the main thing is uh, there's, there's probably three products that we use for pre-emergence and the biggest target would be crabgrass. Um, that being said, uh, prodiamine, pendimethalin, and dithiopyr are the three most common that we use for crabgrass control. And the reason that crabgrass is one of the most important ones that we want to control is because if we do nothing for that, that weed, uh, it does a very good job and it's pretty persistent and we don't see it until it's too late and then it takes over our thinned out areas in the lawn. Uh, so one thing we want to make sure we do is target that first weed and then it's going to pick up on some of the others. So when, when looking at some of the different herbicides, they do have uh, different modes of action. Uh, with prodiamine and pen, pendimethalin, they're strictly pre-emergent herbicides. So if we're looking at controlling crabgrass, we want to be putting that down before it germinates. And in Nebraska, May 1, any time before that, uh, typically is a great time uh, to control that with those two products. Uh, now getting into the thiopyr, uh, that product actually has post control, so we can apply it to crabgrass that's two to three leaf or even one tiller uh, if we get a good application at the high rate. So that one you can actually put down later. Uh, if we wait till we see crabgrass when it's in the one to two leaf stage, then we know we should start getting, getting that product out and it's going to control crabgrass when it's already germinated and up. Uh, and a lot of times these products aren't only sprayable, they're carriers with fertilizers. So we want to make sure that we are uh, looking at how much fertilizer we're putting down with these products as well. So typically in the spring, if we're applying May 1, we really don't need that much nitrogen. Uh, so targeting a half a pound to three quarters of a pound would be plenty. Uh, so if you're putting a pre-emergent pr product down, you want to make sure that you are aware of how much nitrogen you're putting down to get the right rate of the pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, not only is there crabgrass to worry about, but there's other weeds uh, a lot of broadleaf weeds and annual grasses that are germinating at the same time or shortly after, uh, like goosegrass, foxtail, or two that are pretty common in Nebraska and can be a problem. The problem with those is that they are bigger seeded types and we, we do want to get a good pre-emergent layer down, let's say a high rate, uh, at uh, an optimal time in order to control those. And one way to do that is to do split applications. So if we're applying early in the year, let's say April 15th, uh, let's say come June 1, that pre-emergent might not be as effective. So if we do split applications where we're putting two, uh, two half rates down, we might have a better chance at controlling some of those tougher to control weeds. So with, with looking at just your general recommendations uh, here in Nebraska, a single application, May 1, and depending on the year, nothing's written in stone. So watch the weather if we have a cooler spring that can be pushed back. It's not all date specific, uh, so you want to watch that and it's okay to change your plans. Just have one going forward. Matt's last point about checking the current weather conditions also holds true for soil temperature. Most pre-emergents are only effective when the soil temps have been consistently above 55 degrees when the crabgrass seeds germinate. Traditionally in Nebraska, that means the last week in April or the first week in May. For our last landscape lesson, we return to the theme this year of garden trends. And what we're going to focus on today is really not a trend per se, but really a good idea. Let's take a few minutes to talk about do it for me, which means how in the world do you get someone to do what you want them to do in your landscape if you don't want to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. 
One of the garden trends that I want to talk about now is one called Do It For Me, which is totally different than Do It Yourself or Do It With Me. This is one that has really gained traction both with younger viewers, our younger audience, and some of the ones that are getting to be a little bit older and just simply either have done that, gone there, been there, and don't want to do it themselves. So let's talk about really what do it for me means because if you want it done right and you don't want to do it yourself, you're going to have to follow a thinking process that really will allow you to tell whoever it is that is going to do whatever for you exactly what you want done. Now that might sound simple, but what it suggests is that you are really in charge of your own landscape. You are the landscape manager, you are the designer, you are the chooser of colors, you are the one who says I like this style rather than that style. If you don't stop to make those decisions and you simply say gosh I want somebody to come in and lay that sod or somebody to come in and prune those shrubs and you do not give them good direction and certainly choose wisely to begin with you may be very dissatisfied with the results. So let's start with thinking about what are some of those tasks that yes, you could certainly do it yourself, but do you really want somebody to do it for you? One of the ones of course that comes to mind immediately is the cleanup that we talk about. Do you really want to do it yourself? Do you want somebody else to come in and do it for you? You have to tell them what you want cleaned up and how so that they don't inadvertently take off all of your shrubs when you really just wanted some of them pruned or take all the seeds he seed heads off one of your perennials that you really want to reseed itself into the landscape. Maybe you could lay your own sod if you need some new sod or do your own seeding. Well, if you want to do your own sodding, do you want to bring in the big roll by yourself and try to get it laid? Do you want to take those little bitty pieces and then try to pin them together? Where do you want that sod laid? And then are you going to be the one that is going to water it, get it to knit, so that you really have good turf. How about the actual pruning? This is one where pruning is an art form and pruning is also a science. And uh, we're always surprised by the number of people who really don't know how to prune and they certainly don't know when to prune. And that does include people that you might want to have do it for you. So certainly if it's arborist work, we've talked about this a lot, you wanna make sure that you have someone who is certified who can climb that ladder or climb that tree, make sure that that is done in a safe way. The smaller pruning, the shrub work, doing the hedging, doing the removal of old, old canes, doing the cutback or the reduction. Again, if you know what you're doing, you can do it yourself. If you know what you're doing and you don't want to do it yourself, you can communicate that really well with somebody who can do it for you. So you're not actually doing the labor, but what you are doing is giving the good direction. One of the other uh, do it for me trends is containers. And we're seeing this a lot, which is rather than going to the garden center, getting that container, figuring out the media to put in it, picking out all the plants, getting the plants planted, it can be one of two things. It's either take that container to a garden center or to your landscape person who's, who's helping you and then have them just custom pot it for you or you can actually pick the plants out themselves, say this is what I want in here, it comes back as a finished product. Again, that's a little bit uh, different way of engaging with your own landscape. The same thing happens with, with laying a patio or, or building a raised bed. Those are tasks that a lot of people can do themselves. Takes a little bit of study on YouTube or, or again, finding the good information and weeding out the right ways to do it versus the ways that you Yes, you can get it done, but it's not going to last very long. What you're really going to want to do is figure out exactly who is going to do that work for you, how they're going to get it done, and then how you're, you are going to engage in the process. Are you going to give them specific direction on the materials, or are you going to let them choose themselves and then come home and it's finished, or are you going to say, gosh, choose some materials, let me look at those, then I will decide as the homeowner or as the person in charge of this project what I want done specifically. The growing season will soon be upon us. You can enhance your experience by creatively thinking about the things in your landscape you don't want to do yourself, thinking about how you communicate with somebody else to do that for you, and then sitting back and enjoying the fruits of their labor.
It's now time to talk to a garden professional, and today we're going to hear from Randy Wolf from Campbell's Nursery. Randy is going to tell us about all the wonderful things about a new fruit that they are growing in the garden center called Hascap. It's my pleasure to be talking to Randy Wolf from Campbell's Nursery and Garden Centers today about a really interesting new plant, or new to us, and production, and what really is going on in the megatropolis of Lincoln Garden Center world, and really across the state as, as you experience it, Randy. I'm very happy to be here today. So what is this plant that you are actually going to talk about? What is it? Well, it's a, it's a small fruit, and um, it's, it's not new, but it's just a kind of an unknown plant. Mm -hmm. um, we oftentimes call it honeyberry, but uh, if you start researching it, you find out it has a multitude of names. The scientific name is Lonicera carula, Lonicera meaning that it's in the honeysuckle family, mm -hmm. and carula meaning that it's a very dark blue berry, which it is. Mm -hmm. um, and like a lot of berries and grapes, things like that, uh, it does have a, a, a kind of a white film over it, a bloom as we would call it, uh, that uh, is, it just kind of adds to the, to the color. And um, it's an it's easy one to grow, really. Um, so. So, so since it is easy, why have we not seen it in the, in the retail market in this part of the state before? It's um, been used in other parts of the world a lot. And now that we're seeing, you know, um, another group of uh, immigrants in here, they're, they're wanting to grow it. Uh, it's, it's native to the boreal forest or the, the northern parts of the northern hemisphere, oh. the cooler climates. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we don't think about something like that working in Nebraska. However, uh, there's a, a lot of these in northern Japan and uh, Oregon State, a, a professor at Oregon State has done a lot of work and she's developed some. Uh, they do pretty well in, in our latitudes, and so uh, uh, you're going to see more and more of it. It's uh, very, very high in antioxidants, uh, much higher than blueberries, and it has mm. three times the amount of vitamin C that blueberries have. So it um, can sometimes resemble blueberries in flavor, but other people think it tastes more like a, a blackberry or even a raspberry. <laughs> so you, you're going to get uh, different opinions on the flavor. But so, uh, and, and it's male and female plants, right? So you're going to have to have one of each to be able to get the fruit? Not necessarily male and no. female, but um, uh, you will get, on most varieties, you'll get much better pollination if you yeah. have two, two different cultivars mm -hmm. or two different selections. And so um, it's not unlike a lot of our fruits in that regard. Some of the apples are that way and, and uh, some of the other uh, large fruits. but. Um, if you, there are a few varieties that are self-pollinator. They will produce fruit just by themselves. However, we're not talking a large plant here. And so mm. um, a couple or even three or four plants might be good to have just uh, if you like these. These are, are you know, you're just going to have much, that much more production. These can be frozen, they can be dried, they can be canned, they can be made into preserves, just about anything you would normally use a, a blueberry or how you would treat a blueberry. So, do they, uh, do they require the same acid soil that blueberries do? That's one of the, the reasons to, to grow honeyberries is because they don't. Uh, they'll do mm -hmm. just fine in a, in a high pH, in fact, uh, up to uh, soil pHs of eight, which oh uh, is extremely high, yes. Uh, and they'll, they'll do quite low, too, so uh, they're not that particular. Um, probably would, like a lot of plants, uh, prefer to have a nice layer of mulch over top and some uniform soil moisture. Uh, but other than that, they're not, they're not too particular. So is this, in your mind, going to be a plant that replaces the aronia craze? Uh, it sure could. Um, um, like aronia, uh, it can be used to make wine and things like that, and, and uh, of course it can be juiced. Um, the aronia uh, industry has pickers, and this is something that would have to, 
to, to be mm. developed for, for these. The nice thing about uh, the honeyberries is they're getting harvested in, in um, oh, in June, a lot of times when strawberries are ripe, where the aronia uh, waits until till fall or late summer to be harvested. But um, uh, that's, that's probably the one big stumbling block right now. You know. So we will be building a demand for these particular plants just by talking about them. Yes. Do you anticipate this being something that you are geared up for? Is, is, are you going to have many of them available or will it be something that this year people see it, want it, and then the production starts? In our garden centers, we'll have uh, um, some in, in um, larger plants to, that hopefully will entice some people to get started. Uh, I, I look forward to, to build over time and um, maybe someday um, um, outsell the, the blueberries that we sell. Uh, I think if uh, you had a, a um, local producer producing it and selling it at the farmers markets, things like that, that would uh, entice people to, to plant it in their own yard because it's, it's certainly very easy to grow, has very few disease or insect problems, and uh, doesn't get too big. It can be a landscape plant. Yes. A pretty yes. landscape plant. Yes. Blooms uh, kind of a, a yellowish white flower early in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing uh, um, local gardeners need to be concerned about. Um, these um, Oregon State cultivars that uh, have Japanese heritage tend to bloom a little bit later in the spring so they're less likely to get caught by that late hard freeze that we oftentimes get here. So mm -hmm. that's going to ensure a, a bigger crop, better crop later on. Do so. we uh, need to use bird netting over these? Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> As always, The birds right? know a good thing when they see it. And so, um, and that's, um, that's another thing, um, I'm glad you brought that up. The, the berries are a little hard to know when they're ripe. And so when they're the dark blue, you start sampling them. They taste acidic, they're not ready yet. Uh, and probably the birds will be leaving them alone too. But when you start tasting an, a good sweet flavor to them, that's when you want to get the bird net out and, and be ready to, to have a picking party. Pick so. away and go ahead and eat. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, we will look forward to trying them on campus as well so we can talk about it. And hopefully we have all the people who want to grow something that is both beautiful and edible in their landscape can give this one a try. Right. And um, it's... Um, Fairly, fairly maintenance-free, no trimming necessary for the first three or four years, and uh, then minimal f trimming after that. So. That's perfect, too. <laughs> All right, thanks, Randy. You're very welcome. This really is the time of the year when the garden centers and nurseries are buzzing with activity to get ready for the big spring gardening season. And of course, it's amazing to hear about all the interesting new plants Focus on one particular plant that adds to the edible landscape and the beauty of the landscape. So we will look forward actually to adding those has caps to our own backyard farmer garden. We've been hearing from our backyard farmer panelists this season as they answer your frequently asked questions. So let's take a few minutes to hear from them again as they help you find solutions to common questions. hard to say if it's going to be another Japanese beetle year that's going to explode, but let's prepare for that. So we want to see what's in our garden, what maybe was attacked most last year, and see if we can replace that with a less susceptible plant. Uh, Japanese beetles love those linden trees, they love birch, they love grape, and a lot of the fruit trees. So one of the things you can do is if you have a plant, an ornamental that you really want protected, you can do a treatment of a systemic, but this needs to be done in April or May early before the Japanese beetles emerge from the soil. So it's something to think about. We always say around Mother's Day, get something that's labeled for the Japanese beetle and follow that label. Another thing you can do if you know you have some problems in your turf with white grubs, you can do a preventative for white grubs. However, if you don't have white grubs in your yard or you know close by that you can treat for, 
the beetles, when they emerge in June, will be able to fly into your yard. So I don't recommend any treatment for your turf unless you are having problems with white grubs. Also, prepare to you know, have your soapy water and be able to pick off the beetles as soon as they start emerging from the soil, which will be mid-June. And that way, you can remove the beetles, which usually attract other beetles because their feeding um, stimulates the plant to release chemicals to call all those other beetles. So if you notice, this year, the Japanese beetles, wherever one of them landed first, is the plant that normally got most attacked. So you want to be out there to be ready to pick those off to, so they can go somewhere else for the summer. So even though we don't know if it's going to be a bad Japanese beetle year, we want to prepare and be ready and treat what is most important to us. When we plant them, we want to make sure that the root flare of the tree is at the surface. So you may have to dig through the ball a little bit to find where the, where the stem starts to flare out to the roots, root system, and that's where we need to have that. So making sure that we don't plant things too deep really gets us a long way in getting things started well for the plant. And I, I tend to err on being a, a tad high, so an inch or so high, I feel a little bit better about that. Uh, making sure that we're following up good with watering as we go through that um, uh, after the tree is planted. You know, a couple inches of mulch, those are all things that get us off to a good start. If you're planting something that's in a pot, um, when you pull the plant out of the pot, take a look and make sure that we don't have any circling roots that are going around the outside of the ball. And those can be either simply cut off and pulled out of there so that we don't continue to have that, that action of those root systems circling around, the, circling around itself. Or if, it, if they're not real large, you can straighten them out, maybe do a little bit of pruning on the root system. But doing some of that work, teasing those roots out at planting, again, kind of helps with the longevity of the plant. Thanks to all our panelists who contributed to the show this year. And don't forget, Backyard Farmer begins again in April when you'll have a chance to be sending in your own questions to the show. As we wind down today's program, we're going to be taking a look at the pros and cons of cutting back and cleaning up those perennials in the landscape. It's only natural to want to get out there on those warmer days and do a little cleanup. You might want to hold off on that for the time being. We recently went to the Backyard Farmer Garden to show you what we mean. Longer days and a little bit of sunshine and of course those warm temperatures that actually seem to have shown up on the weekends make gardeners want to get outside, start cutting back, cleaning up, getting ready for spring. Cautionary note, however, this is still February, it's almost March, we have a lot of late winter, early spring left to come and doing too much cutback, too much cleanup and too much opening up of the soil and those plants to the elements can really cause problems later in the landscape. So one of the things that we really recommend doing is if you do want to start doing the cleanup, because of course in a big garden like this it takes a long time, don't cut everything all the way back to the ground. Go ahead and take off a portion of it, but leave a part of the plant material standing. That does a lot of good in terms of helping to collect whatever moisture we do get. It helps protect the crowns of those plants from desiccation in the winter months. And we have a lot of plants that have actually, actually already started to sprout. As an example, if you have hardy chrysanthemums, they're out of the ground already. We have some of the sedums that are out of the ground. And again, you wanna make sure that you are not exposing them too abruptly to the elements with six or even eight weeks left of this pretty brutal, windy, up and down weather in spring in Nebraska. We all know what happens if we don't get our gutters cleaned out or the ends of the downspouts. The same thing can happen, however, with your rain garden, if you have one, or your bioswale. And that would be if you have pipes that are going under a walk or going under your patio, or in our case, under our paths. Those whole inlets and outlets can really get clogged with plant debris and leaves and all sorts of stuff and junk that blew in over the winter months. And that can really be damaging if we do end up getting 
pretty high intensity rains that fill those ponds or fill those rain chain areas, that water cannot drain through. It's going to sit, maybe soak in, maybe not, maybe overflow, cause all, all sorts of issues. So again, this is a good time to get down in there and at least pull some of those leaves away from those inlets and outlets without totally exposing everything. You can also see what happens in this particular spot if we really do have a lot of bare soil. And this is actually showing the germination already of one of our common annual plants that we had in the backyard farmer garden. Coming out of the ground already, we have a, a set of true leaves on some of these. Pretty cool to have that completely exposed to these weather conditions. So totally bare soil is not a great idea in this kind of weather either. A lot of us have bulbs that have already popped out of the ground in some of those warmer days, just like these tulips in our backyard farmer garden. And the disadvantage of that, again, is that as the temperatures spike and the wind blows and we don't have any snow cover, they can really be exposed to the elements. In addition, these nice little chewy, luscious green shoots are perfect for the taking by waskly wabbits or other critters. So what you want to do, perhaps, is make sure that you give them a little bit of cover, cover that soil so it doesn't blow or erode. Use maybe some of the cuttings that you've taken from other areas of the landscape or the garden. Kind of cover those a little bit, keep them a bit protected. And then, of course, as always in the garden, we want to scout. Make sure that nothing is going on that you really don't want to have happen, whether it's critter damage or, again, erosion or inadvertent footprints stepping on those bulbs. Take care of that when you see it and then get ready for spring. Mother Nature can be cruel and we all know that's especially true here in Nebraska. It's great to see some of those bulbs poking out of the ground this time of year. To help them along, some of that plant material can really go a long ways to protecting them from those late spring freezes. The growing season is right around the corner. Take it easy and enjoy for now. We really had a great time sharing our show with you this year. If you missed any episodes, you can find them on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. We do hope you'll join us for another great year on Backyard Farmer, which is coming up the first week in April, right here on NET. So with that, good morning, good gardening. Thank you for joining us for Lifestyle Gardening.